They all gathered on the quilt and at the table. Esperanza sat down and pulled the massive blanket next to her, took the needle, and began crocheting the final stitches. When Mama could finally speak, she looked at Abuelita and asked the same thing Esperanza had asked. How did you get here? Miguel, said Abuelita, he came for me. Luis and Marco have been impossible. If I went to the market, one of their spies would follow me. I thought, I think they thought you were still in the area and would eventually come back for me. Ten stitches up to the top of the mountain. Esperanza listened to Abuelita tell Mama about how infuriated Tio Luis had been when he figured out they were gone. He'd become obsessed with finding them and questioned all of their neighbors, including Senor Rodriguez. They had even come to the convent to question her sisters, but no one told him anything. Add one stitch. A few months after they left, she'd had a premonition that something was wrong with Mama. The feeling would not let go of her, so she lit candles every day for months and prayed for their safety. Nine stitches down to the bottom of the valley. Then one day, when she had almost given up hope, she found an injured bird in the garden that she did not think would fly again. But the next morning when she approached it, the bird lifted into the sky. She knew it was a sign that whatever had been wrong was better. Skip one stitch. Then one of the nuns brought her a note that someone had left in the poor box addressed to her. It had been from Miguel. He suspected that Abuelita was being watched so he delivered his notes in the dark, telling her of his plan. Ten stitches up to the top of the mountain, Miguel and Senor Rodriguez came in the middle of the night and took her to the train station. It was all very exciting, and Miguel didn't leave her side once during the entire trip. He brought her all the way here. Add one stitch. He said that Ramona and Esperanza needed her. He was right, said Mama, her eyes teary again, gratefully looking at Miguel. Mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. So many of them, thought Esperanza. When a strand of her hair fell into her lap, she picked it up and wove it into the blanket, so that all the happiness and emotion she felt at this moment would go with it forever. When Esperanza told Abuelita their story about all that had happened to them, she didn't measure time by the usual seasons. Instead, she told it as a field worker in spans of fruits and vegetables and by what needed to be done to the land. They had arrived in the valley at the end of the grapes, Thompson seedless, red malagas, and the blue-black ribers. Mama breathed in the dust at the end of the grapes, and that's when she got sick. Then it had been time to go prune the grapes and get ready for potatoes. Working potatoes was the heart of winter and the cold that dampened the bones. And during potato eyes, Mama had gone to the hospital. There had been no months with names, only the time of tying canes amidst the ghosts of grapes and gray days that never warmed. But afterward came the anticipation of spring and a valley pregnant with needs, graceful asparagus, ripening vineyards and groaning trees. Then early peaches called, crickets in the field started their nightly symphonies, and Mama came home. Abuelita arrived during plums, and now the grapes were delivering another harvest, and Esperanza was turning another year. A few days before her birthday, Esperanza begged Miguel to drive her to the foothills before sunrise. There was something she wanted to do. She woke in the dark and tiptoed from the cabin. They followed the dirt road that headed east and parked when they could go no farther. In the gray light, they could see a small footpath to a plateau. When they got to the top, Esperanza looked out over the valley. The cool, almost morning air filled her senses. Below, she could see the white roofs of the cabins in straight rows, the fields beginning to take form, and over the eastern mountains, a hopeful brightening. She bent over and touched the grass. It was cool but dry. She lay down on her stomach and patted the ground next to her. Miguel, did you know that if you lie on the ground and stay very still, you could feel the earth's heart beating? He looked at her skeptically. 
She patted the ground again. Then he lay down as she was facing her. Will this happen soon, Esperanza? Wait a little while and the fruit will fall into your hand. He smiled and nodded. They were still. She watched Miguel watching her, and then she felt it, beginning softly, a gentle thumping repeating itself, then stronger. She heard it too. Shoom, shoom, shoom. The earth's heartbeat, just like she had felt it, it that day with Papa. Miguel smiled, and she knew that he felt it too. The sun peeked over a rim of the dark, distant ridge, bursting the dawn onto the waiting fields. She felt its warm washing over her and turned on her back and faced the sky, staring into the clouds now tinged with pink and orange. As the sun rose, Esperanza began to feel as if she rose with it, floating again, like that day on the mountain. When she first arrived in the valley, she closed her eyes, and this time she did not careen out of control. Instead, she glided above the earth unafraid. She let herself be lifted into the sky, and she knew that she would not slip away. She knew that she would never lose Papa or El Rancho de las Rosas or Abuelita or Mama, no matter what. It was as Carmen, the egg woman, had said on the train. She had her family, a garden full of roses, her faith, and the memories of those who had gone before her. But now... She had even more than that, and it carried her up as on the wings of the phoenix. She soared with the anticipation of dreams she never knew she could have, of learning English, of supporting her family, of someday buying a tiny house. Miguel had been right about never giving up, and she had been right, too, about rising above those who held them down. She hovered high above the valley, its basin surrounded by the mountains. She swooped over Papa's rose blooms, buoyed by rose hips that remembered all the beauty they had seen. She waved at Isabel and Abuelita, walking barefoot in the vineyards, wearing grapevine wreaths in their hair. She saw Mama sitting on a blanket, a cacophony of color that covered an acre in zigzag rows. She saw Marta and her mother walking in an almond grove, holding hands. Then she flew over a river, a thrusting torrent that cut through the mountains. And there, in the middle of the wilderness, was a girl in a blue silk dress and a boy with his hair slicked down eating mangoes on a stick, carved to look like exotic flowers, sitting on a grassy bank on the same side of the river. Esperanza reached for Miguel's hand and found it. Even though her, mi her mind was soaring to infinite possibilities, his touch held her heart to the earth. On the morning of her birthday, Esperanza heard the voices coming from outside her window. She could pick out Miguel's, Alfonso's, and Juan's. She sat up in bed and listened and smiled. Esperanza lifted the curtain. Isabel came over to her bed and looked out with her, clutching her doll. They both blew kisses to the men who sang the birthday song. Then Esperanza waved them inside, not to open gifts, but because she could already smell coffee coming from the kitchen. They gathered for breakfast. Mama and Abuelita, Hortensia and Alfonso, Josefina and Juan, the babies and Isabel. Irene and Melina came too, with their family, and Miguel. It wasn't exactly like the birthdays of her past, but it would still be a celebration under the mulberry and chinaberry trees with newborn rosebuds from Papa's garden. Although there were no papayas, there was cantaloupe, lime, and coconut salad, and machada burritos topped with lots of laughter and teasing. At the end of the meal, Josefina brought out a flan de almendras, Esperanza's favorite, and they sang the birthday song to her again. Isabel sat next to Abuelita at the wooden table. They each held crochet hooks in a skein of yarn. Now watch, Isabel, ten stitches up to the top of the mountain. Abuelita demonstrated, and Isabel carefully copied her movements. The needle rocked awkwardly, and at the end of her beginning rows, Isabel held up her work to show Esperanza. Mine is all crooked. Esperanza smiled and reached out and gently pulled the yarn, unraveling the uneven stitches. Then... She looked into Isabel's trusting eyes and said, 
do not ever be afraid to start over. So I hope you guys liked the book.